Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pay to Pay Real Estate Show. I'm your host, Willie Morales. And on today's show, I have Ling Ying Zhao. Did I pronounce that right? Ling Ying Zhao. Lin Ying Zhou. Uh, she is the CEO and founder of Acris Capital. Lin Ying, thank you so much for being on Pay to Pay Real Estate Show. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I am good. I am good. You know, uh, um, you know, before we got on, we talked a little bit, and I'm just amazed at your career. Um, tell us, like, when you got here at the age of 10, did you know at that age you were entrepreneurial? Did you know that real estate was the way to go, or did you fall into it as you got a little older? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, I don't know what I wanted to be when I was 10. I don't know if you remember what you wanted to be when you were 10. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think my education and just the education system in the U.S. in general, right, is always priming you for to go to a good school, to go to a good college, and then go get a good job, a corporate job, white collar job, and then you kind of try to climb the corporate ladder and you're 65 and then you retire. So I think, you know, as I was growing up, I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur, that I always thought of myself as working for someone else because I always thought, you know, being an entrepreneur is so hard, you know? There's so many things to consider. It is so risky. Um, it's so much easier to just get a job, you know, get a good paying job, and then, you know, try to play the politics and climb the ladder and then eventually get a fancy title and then retire uh, with a big house and, you know, and things like that. So, yeah, entrepreneur was never in my background. My family, my family doesn't really have that many entrepreneurs either. I mean, I have an uncle that has a small construction company and that's about it, so. Wow. So, it basically, as you got older, you kind of fell into it. Mm -hmm. So, tell us, like, when you became a Wall Street trader, how was that journey? Like, um, obviously, you went to, I'm assuming you went to college and then you got your degree. Was it your, your degree in finance or how, how did that come about you getting into the world of trading? Yeah, so I graduated in, I graduated from Boston College in 2008 and with a finance and accounting degree. Um, mm. I really got the accounting degree as like an extra because I really knew that I did not want, I didn't want to be an accountant. It's pretty boring. So no offense <laughs> to all the accountants out there, but it's pretty boring to me. Uh, but um, I think I graduated, so I graduated in the worst of times with a finance degree, you know, 2008, financial crisis, all that. So I got a job as an analyst uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. I, I live in Boston. So in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, as a trader for a fraternal insurance company. And the pay wasn't great, uh, but, you know, I had a job. I had a chance to learn, uh, which is very valuable. You know, I had a good, uh, I had a good managers that, you know, that really taught me a lot. And then I eventually I moved back to Boston um, and that's when I kind of got into trading because just through analysis, understanding the relative value about, you know, how trade ideas work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I really wanted to be a trader because it's more exciting. It's more challenging. And there are new things that happen every day versus as an analyst, you basically sit behind a spreadsheet all the time. So over the last four years, I became a trader kind of desk analyst and like a side portfolio manager for this small asset manager in Boston. And we, we deal with a lot of people on Wall Street um, as well. So it's been a really interesting experience because it really adds an arsenal of tools to what I do right now. Yeah, no, definitely because, and, and you know this well as anybody that's in the real estate business, everything runs on numbers. You got to know your numbers, you know, what goes in and what comes out. So after you did the trading, how long was it before you got into real estate? Um, and what was that first purchase that you, you made? Uh, when I was in finance, I actually had bought my first rental property uh, back in 2010. Okay. So about two years out of college, I bought my first rental property. You know, it's an American dream. You know, I'm Chinese. Uh, I have a Chinese background. So, you know, for my parents, for my family, it's always, hey, let's buy property, right? They never own property. So they really look upon me to kind of start that American dream. So I bought my first rental property in 2010. Um, so I, and then I bought a condo, which I live in, uh, in 2014. So, but, you know, my, my life since then was always, you know, just managing the rental assets. I thought about accumulating more, but my, my full-time job always held me back because I was so busy with my full-time job and 
I was just like, oh, this is so much work, you know, to have to go look at properties on the weekend or after work and then figure out, you know, the financing, the, you know, the due diligence, the renovations, it's just too much work. So I pretty much bought that, those two properties and then I was on hold uh, until 2017 when I left my job. Um, when I left my job, I actually went traveling for about six months. And then after I got back from my boat travels, that's when my business partners and I actually got together and started Acres Capital, which is a you know, real, real estate investment company, which now I do full time. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. So when you bought that, your first property, it was a single family. Um, you know, the question I always get asked, and I'm pretty sure you do too, in your travels is, oh, how do you fund your first deal? So was that through your job with savings and you put the, you, you know, the conventional route, 20% down, that's, that's how you did it? The same thing with your condo? Actually, it was a three family. That oh, two my, family, sorry, yes. Yeah, okay. so my, my first property was a three, three family. And, you know, 2010 real estate was very cheap. Yes. It was very, very cheap. So it was a half a million dollar property. Um, and so I basically financed it with, um, there was, so in, in mass, there is, you know, programs for first time owners right. and the, and the rates were like very cheap and, you know, you can get a conventional loan or you can put like less down. So it was, I think it was like 15 to 25% down, but if you put less than 20% down, you had to pay the, um, what you call it? The FHA. Uh it's a PMI? A PMI. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't want to pay that. So I, I think for my first purchase, I actually put 20% down on that property at the time. And honestly, it was, you know, I was only two years out of school. So it was a family effort. Like my parents, like helped me fund my first property. Um, so they, they still they still say that they own a third of it. So, you know, <laughs> to this day. So I'm like, okay, you own a third of it. You know, when I sell, I'll give you a third of money back. Um, yeah. so, um, so it was definitely a family effort at the time, but it was a good investment just because the market conditions was so good and the rates were really low. I mean, I refied within a year and I think my current rate on it is still three and three quarters. So 3.75% wow. on it. Yeah. Oh my God. That's a, that's a great rate. Yeah. So exactly. you still had the property to this day and then the condo is more of a personal, personal home for yourself. Yes. So, you know, and I guess asking the question is how, why did you decide that multifamily was the best way? Because so many people, and again, I'm pretty sure you know this, they either want to start wholesaling as their first investments, add a couple of S's at the end, and they want to do, you know, the flip and get the quick dollars, or they might want to buy a single family as their first um, investment, so to speak. What made you decide that multifamily was the way to go at first at such a young age and second, uh, taking that, I hate to say type of risk because it's such a, you know, a, a big endeavor, three families. What, what drove you to do that? It's really the passive income aspect of it because at that time I had a full-time job and my full-time job required a lot of my attention and time to do. So it was impossible for me to do like a wholesaling or a fix and flip because that is very transactional and that requires a lot more work and a lot more time spent for me so at the time because real estate was so cheap that you know it was easy to say to go in and and, and get this three family and kind of map out the cash flow that that will come from it um and the returns were spectacular at the time and um, so, you know, when I was thinking, hey, I want to buy real estate and I want to buy real estate that's fairly hands off, that multifamily was the first thing I gravitated toward. And it's, you know, and given, you know, given the prices of real estate at the time, you know, it just makes more sense to buy a three family than a single family because then you have more tenants and more cash flow possibilities and things like that. Yeah. And then at the, at the same time, which is, I think, a smart decision is, you know, when you rent a, rent out a single family and if it's empty, that's 100% empty. Right. Here, at least if you got three families, one goes, you still got two thirds to, to depend on. So that's, I, I, I understand that now. So when- Actually, you, actually, sorry to interrupt you. There's a, no, another no, aspect. There's another aspect too. I actually was house hacking that three family. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> so you were living in one, one apartment and the other two you're renting out? Right, right. I house hacked it for about like, for, for a couple of months. And then I realized that I didn't like living in that location because it's so far away from my work. 
Um, so I, I moved, but you know, I house hacked for a few months there and you know, I was doing, you know, managing the whole process and stuff. And yeah, so that's actually a really valuable tool for anyone that wants to kind of get real, starting real estate is house hacking because then you get the cash flow that supports your mortgage. Yeah, and you know, and in certain situations, and you and you're more of a family multifamily expert than I am, but in this day and age, can someone that's a first time home buyer, I, I know you don't want to pay the PMI, but if somebody is a first time home buyer and it's a multifamily, can they still put down three and a half percent and get an FHA loan? Um, or it has to be a single family to get the FHA loan. That part, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm not the expert in that, but I think you can. Um, okay. I think people have done it for like two families if they plan to live in one yeah. and rent out the other. Uh, but obviously, you know, people should check online resources because yeah, no, I'm not check. the yeah. expert. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, I, yeah. So I, I, cause I wanted to know that because I know with single family, you can put three and a half percent down. But I know in multifamily, if you live in one, I think, like you said, the rates could be a little lower or something. Um, so what, how long before, or, or after you got your, your, you know, your properties, which is the, the multifamily and the condo, did you decide to start Acres Capital? Uh, and what made you want to do that, like to, to get into that, uh, in, let's say, lending? Yeah. Um, or it, it purchasing, was about, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it was about four years, actually. So I left my job. I left my full-time job back in 2017. And it, it, it just wasn't a good fit for what I wanted to do going forward. Um, culturally and both, you know, in terms of what I'm looking for in life. Um, so I, I le when I left, after I left that job, I went traveling for six months. And during that time period, uh, my rental property, and I started airbnb my condo out because I was on the road. So I, didn't, I don't live there anymore. So I started getting that supplemental income as well. So both those properties supported me while I was traveling on the road because I had no other, no other income right at the time. So I traveled for about six months, and then um, and then I was actually with my current business partners through Russia and Mongolia, and uh, at that time we kind of start getting our heads together to think about what do we do after we get back to real life per se, right? <laughs> right. And and uh, and one thing that they that we share in common was real estate. Uh, they also own rental properties, which were supporting them on the road, and I happen to have the same so we got together and say okay let's go into real estate because it's a really great way to generate passive income you know it what we're looking to do our goal is to be um you know to is to have financial freedom so that we can right. travel we can spend time with families um so having kind of being very focused in this asset class i think is it's so valuable going forward and so for my business partners and i it was just a you know, it was just an easy decision to go into real estate and institutionalize it so we can bring it to more investors. Right. How did you um, meet your partners? So uh, Christina, so my business partners, Christina and Charlie, uh, Christina actually works, uh, she worked with me at my, uh, at the asset management firm. Okay. Um, when, so we've been working together now for about eight years now, um, oh, but wow. she was the mortgage-backed security analyst and portfolio manager. So we know a lot, a lot about real estate already because her background is in mortgages. And then, you know, I was the corporate trader. So I focus on, you know, buying fixed income debt of companies, you know, like Dell right. or Microsoft or something whatever. like that. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so... With, you know, what's happening now in the world with the pandemic and, and things, um, has, has it affected your business in any way? Um, how, how is business for you, um, you know, go, you know go, going through this? Yeah, I think the challenge is for a lot of property owners right now is in collections, right? That a lot yeah. of tenants are not able to pay rent. Uh, on some of our properties, our collections have fallen. We have encountered tenants who have trouble Paying rent, I've set up, you know, we've set up payment schedules and stuff with them. Right. Um, but there's definitely been instances where there's been higher delinquencies where, you know, people just up and left after not paying for a few months. And there's nothing you can really do about that in this environment. Right. Um, but, you know, that's on the asset management side. On the, on the deal side, it's been, I would say it's been slow. Um, understandably, it's been slow. Um, you know, sellers are not really super motivated to sell in this market environment. Yeah. So we haven't seen a lot of inventory come out. 
Um, but you know, we're still looking. All you can do is still just look and do the work, and hopefully, you know, you get one that's good. So. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, because you know, I read a report. I don't know if it was in the Wall Street Journal or or the National Association of Realtors. It was one of those um, periodicals where they think that, you know, once the pandemic dies down, but, you know, with jobs and, you know, some jobs are not coming back, there might be tons and tons of foreclosures available. I mean, listen, we, we, hate, we hate to see people lose their homes, obviously, but I guess the opportunity will be there maybe down the road. But like you said, it's slow now, but you're still looking. Um, do you, would you consider any other asset class besides multifamily? Would you, you know, like, uh, um storage units or anything like that um what what is like the future plan uh for your company well our company's current core focus so we have two different strategies in our company right now so we have uh what we call a direct acquisition strategy which is kind of like buying small multifamilies like you and i right we don't bring in investors uh it's just the three of us you know buying properties um, and we actually is currently in the middle of selling our assets in Washington state. And then uh, 10, we plan to 1031 the proceeds into, uh, into new assets, you know, bigger buildings essentially. And that really provides the goal for that strategy is to provide the passive income for the, for the GPs, for general partners. Um, yeah. And, you know, for us, you know, there could be a side strategy with that, which is like maybe a joint venture with a high net worth investor or another strategic partner with that strategy. Um, the other one is the syndication strategy. So, you know, for real estate syndication, for those that now know it, it's essentially a pooling of assets uh, from small investors, small to big. Uh, in order to buy a large apartment building because there's economies of scale in only larger buildings, you know? Uh, so, you know, let's say for a 300 unit complex in Texas, you know, we bring in investors uh, that, uh, that invest a minimum of $50,000 each. And then they will get, they're completely passive. They will get the monthly or quarterly distribution uh, that's stated in the, in the deal. And then at this position of your property, which is generally five to seven years, they will get the gain, their, sh their portion of the gain, right, from right. the sale. And that's, you know, that, that's generally, nowadays it's a 7% press return. And then you have the, uh, and then you have the annual return, which is around like 15 to 17%, uh, which is still really good versus all the other asset classes out there. Um, our company is always looking. I mean, we want to be very focused in our strategy, but at the same time, we're not closing our eyes and ears off to all the other possibilities. Uh, we've looked into, we're currently looking into self-storage. Uh, we're currently looking into RV parks, but that, that's like very much a size, size strategy. Like that's on the back burner. If we have some time, we'll, we'll, we'll do some more research and see if there's anything going on there. Right. You know, we, the part, the properties that you look for, um, if you don't mind sharing a little bit of your secret, is, is there, uh, do you work with brokers to find these type of properties or do you look online like at maybe CoStar or, uh, you know, Zillow or anything like that? Like, how do you uh, find your properties? Because, I, you know, that's always the biggest question for some investors that I've talked to. They say, oh, you know, not too many realtors are investor friendly. You know, so that's always a strike, unfortunately, against the realtor. So then they turn into online, you know, and trying mm. to find that gem on, on whether it's Zillow or Craigslist. How do you guys um, look for your deals? I would say for the smaller properties, the first few that we bought, uh, we actually, all the properties essentially came from off-market listings. Okay. So we went through, so it's, you know, if you're trying to build a really small a rental portfolio, like let's say all you're looking to buy is duplexes, you know, triplexes or, you know, four units. Um, it's, it's important to build a relationship with wholesalers because if you get into the circle of wholesalers, sure, they charge a wholesaling fee, but usually the deals they bring are very exclusive and you, you get on that list and then you'll be able to uh, basically buy them before other people see it in a sense. So, mm -hmm. Um, so I think, so for our first couple of deals, um, we work with a wholesaler up in Washington state pretty, pretty exclusively. 
And he brought us two deals that we are currently dispositioning right now, which are, have turned out to be really good investments. And then the other one was just with a larger broker, but then, you know, it was a, it was a pre-listing. Um, so at the end of the day, it's real, all about relationships. Um, online stuff, when, once it hits MLS, it's probably been dug through several times by several groups of people. Yeah. So it's really important that if you want to get a good deal to build that relationship on the larger properties, you know, because there, there's a more sophisticated seller base that they usually work with like larger brokers. So at the end of the day, it becomes relationship too. that if you show that you have a track record that you can close, um, then these brokers will take you seriously. And then you, they will show you some pocket listings they have, but you can't even make that request because at the end of the day, they're working with so many buyers and they really just have to have the good relationship with you for them to show you these deals that they're not showing to anyone else. Because at the end of the day, it's about ability to close, right? Ability to close and ability to be efficient and, you know, and not be too much trouble in a sense. Yeah, you don't want to be a tie kicker because after a while, the broker's not even going to take you serious. Right. So, you know, and it's funny that because you were talking about like how deals get on the MLS and it's usually been looked at like a hundred times. And I remember I did a podcast about that, like off market deals. And I did mention realtors and, you know, but I also said, listen, you, the first thing you're going to say, oh, aren't there, aren't, aren't there properties listed? But they have pocket listings, like mm -hmm. you just mentioned. And these are deals or these are properties that, hey, they'll go to certain people, they know that they're gonna close. Right. And I think that's a, a, a perfect, um, it's perfect what you said. So where, like for, 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 for the market, um, I know it's hard to predict in the next three to six months because we don't know what's gonna happen obviously with the pandemic and all that, but what are the future plans um, for, your, for, your, for Aquis? Uh, our future plans continue to be, you know, right now we're focused, our, our, our core strategy has always been focused on markets that are uh, in migration, uh, inland growth markets. So they're experiencing immigration uh, from coastal cities. So we focus mostly on secondary markets right now. So we're in Arizona, we're in uh, the greater Phoenix area. Uh, we have a portfolio of assets in Dallas and in Orlando. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, that's going to be our continued focus going forward, is focus on these cities experiencing a tremendous amount of population growth and drop growth. And even after the pandemic finishes, they will still benefit because the, all the remote working um, makes, you know, living in an expensive city more obsolete. Because if you can't work, if you can work from anywhere, why do you want to live in a, in a state that has high taxes, uh, you know, really high density, you know, you can't get much for much bang for your buck in a sense. So we continue to focus on these, uh, these cities as well. And then, you know, our other focus is that we want to focus on cities that are, um, that are more landlord friendly, because that's very important given the current, uh, just the current trend. Yeah. Um, you know, I live in a very, very, uh, very, very tenant friendly state. Uh, I live in Massachusetts and, you know, there's been talks of rent control and talks about rent freezes and all that. So we want to kind of avoid those cities where that's going to become more of a more issue going forward. Yeah. Listen, New York is, I mean, I think it was last year, yes. um, you know, they signed into law that you can't, you know, basically anybody that has a multifamily, and they try to do a value add, they can't raise the rent no more than two or three percent or whatever the, the, mm -hmm. the, the ceiling. So uh, tons of landlords were complaining about this. I mean, I remember I went to a few networking events and they were just talking about this, you know, yeah. like how they're gonna ruin you know, real estate in New York City. And especially now, with what, what, and I don't know uh, if you're getting into this like a, a office uh, um, investments, but I, I one guy that I saw, they're looking to cut back on their workforce in office space and have them work from home. Mm -hmm. So this one gentleman sees like 20% of his workforce working from home because A, they were able to uh, work longer and B, they either were taking care of a loved one or, or let's say a newborn. And they found them more productive because they were working almost 10 to 12, 10, 11 hours a day. And I'm like, what? And this one a gentleman was like sky high about the future. Because uh, he said he'll save a lot of money and make a lot of money. Um, yeah. What do you think about that, uh, in your opinion? I don't know if you're in the office market or, or thinking about it down the road, but in your opinion as an investor and, uh, and just 
overall view of the market. What, what do you think? I think so. We're not in office. We're not in retail. Um, you know, we have a very strict focus right now on multifamily, and then you know, uh, self storage and RV parks is a side strategy. But um, you know, when we first got started in this business, there's a reason why we chose multifamily because it, it is an essential human need, right? Food and shelter. Um, yes. So it doesn't matter how the economy goes. There's always going to be people that need apartments that they they need. A roof over their heads. So that's why we're focused on multifamily. In terms of your outlook for office, I would say, yeah, office as we know it will, won't exist, right? This pandemic has changed the office landscape into something completely different. I don't know what yet. You know, it may be smaller, it may be smaller offices, it may be, you know, the, the elimination of uh, open space. Um, or maybe more share spaces and like more we work and things like that. Mm. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, you know, the office space is that I, I feel like it, there'll be less need there. Um, now I'm not the expert in the office obviously, but I think there could be opportunity where if you can convert offices into multifamily, there may be opportunities there as well. Um, if there are any developers doing that kind of project, because every city, especially expensive cities, uh, they always need more apartments. So if you have the opportunity to convert office or hotel or, you know, or retail into apartment buildings, then I think a lot of cities will take advantage of that. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point because I think eventually, um, you know, if you got all these office spaces that are empty and, you know, people working from home or like you said, working in something like a WeWork type of space, Mm -hmm. I mean, for you to spend three, four, five, whatever it is, $10,000 a square foot to maintain the staff, I mean, shoot, you could just do it in WeWork or, or from home. Right. Um, so before I let you go, just one or two more things. With the, with the multifamily space the way it is, uh, especially whether it's two family, three family, or four units, and now you're looking to get into two or 300 uh, units, the investors that you seek, are, are they more accredited investors or can someone that uh, is not accredited uh, invest um, with Acris? Yeah, uh, definitely. So for syndication deals, there's two different types of structures. So there's a 506B and 506C. And, you know, that's the SEC designation, right? And the 506C is, uh, is essentially marketed only to accredited investors. And the reason for that is these deals can be marketed publicly. So if you go on Facebook and you say, hey, you know, I have this deal, I want to raise money, blah, 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 that's allowed. But for 506B deals, um, these are deals that are for both sophisticated and accredited investors. Oh. So these deals are allowed to take on a certain portion of individuals who are not accredited. And, uh, and it's important to SEC to make sure that that all the investors in the deal knows what they're getting into. So the GPs, the general partners of the deal, have to show that they have a pre-existing relationship with these sophisticated investors and they've educated them on these deals. Um, so, you know, so that even though they're not accredited, they're still comfortable and educated enough to be in the deals. So most of the deals that we've done have been 506B deals. So mm -hmm. that the um, so even non-credit investors can get involved, and the minimum, as I said, is generally around fifty thousand dollars, and um, and it could be you know just your liquid assets, or it could be like SDIRA. Right. No, that's great. I mean, I I, I love the fact that you give them pr pretty much uh, if they have the money, uh, a chance to invest with um, with Acres Capital, mm -hmm. um, and then you teach, and then you also now someone that's not accredited right but they have the money and they want to get into real estate and you said that you educate what type of education would you provide for uh for someone like that that doesn't have the experience but they feel that this is an investment that they could get into mm -hmm. uh, earn some passive income and also maybe it, it, it could be a way for them to get out of the job in the future yeah so education is such an important part of our company uh, we want to make sure that every investor that we have are educated in the risk and returns of what they're investing in. So we actually have monthly newsletters where we create educational content that gets pushed out. Um, also, we actually recently wrote a white paper called the New Roadmap to Financial Freedom, which you can download on the website. 
uh, but it kind of details out, you know, some of the steps you can take to get to the point where you generate enough passive income uh, to get to the financial freedom number. Um, so for, for us, and then, you know, once you get, you know, if you subscribe to our newsletter, uh, we have all these content that's available. It's also on our website. You know, we do spotlights on markets on why we're in a particular market. We teach people how to set up SDRAs. Uh, we talk about the effect of compounding interest. Um, you know, we talk about what syndication is and how you can make money in syndication, what to look out for in a syndication deal. And then once we have a deal, you know, and, you know, the investor has gone through the onboarding process and understand, you know, the basics of what syndication is about, we generally have a pitch deck, a marketing material, we generally host a webinar, and then we're always available to answer your questions. So you can literally call any one of us up and say, hey, I have a question about this deal, or I just have a general question, I, you know, it doesn't, you know, regarding real estate. And we're always available to kind of educate and get people, help people kind of move along in their real estate investing path and, you know, get to that point. Yeah, no, no. Listen, I think at the end of the day, just like you did, you want to earn passive income. You don't want to rely on the nine to five and especially rely on a poultry social security check. In this day and age, you need multiple streams of income. And real estate is definitely one of them. Listen, Lin Ying, thank you so much for being on Peer to Peer Real Estate. I really, really appreciate it. If somebody wanted to get in contact with you, what's the best way? Uh, please go on the website at www.acriscapital.com. I'm sure you have the link somewhere in the description, yes. so I'm not going to no, spell it out. No, uh, no, it's but, okay. I'll put it on the show notes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, my, uh, my, my personal email is L, lzou at acriscapital.com. So, All right, sounds uh, good. Feel free to send me an email. I'm available. <laughs> no, no, definitely. Listen, like I said, I'll definitely put it uh, put it on the show notes so everybody could uh, uh, find you. And again, thank you so much for being on Peer to Peer Real Estate. I really, really appreciate it. I learned a lot. So oh, uh, thank you. It, it, it was uh, it was a definite learning experience about uh, multifamily. So again, thank you so much. No, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. No, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, everyone, that was Ling Ying Zhou from Acris Capital. You can find her at acriscapital.com and you can find her at lzo at acriscapital.com. That's L Z O U at Acris, A K R A S, capital.com. Ling Ying, thank you so much for being on today's peer to peer real estate show. Really, really appreciate it. You can find me at peer to peer real estate.com. That's peer to number two, peer real estate.com. Check out our past shows, our blog, and our resource page. And eventually, we're going to be updating the website. So I'll let you guys know about that. Also, please go to Apple Podcasts. Please subscribe and leave a review. Look for us at peer to peer real estate podcast. And before I go, just a couple of more things, guys. Do not give up on your dream. Don't let anyone talk you out of it. And I really believe you keep the momentum going, good things will happen. Anyway, on behalf of Peter Peter Real Estate, I'm William Morales. Until next time, thanks, everybody, and please stay safe. Bye.